what you've been doing with your time lately, but I, I get fascinated with the Olympics. I absolutely love them. It's like the world coming together in something positive, which I desperately need right now. And um, the athletes and the stuff that they do, uh, I mean, curling looks easy, but it's actually not. <laughs> And, and these guys are shooting a 40 pound stone down 150 feet of ice and getting it within inches of where they want it to go. And all you have to do is go watch Sean White do some snowboarding to know that it is not normal for a human being to do 1330 degree rotation in the air on a snowboard. Um, the stuff these guys do is incredible and it comes at just a life of dedication. Um, they have spent so many countless hours pointed in one direction of getting just excellent at this one thing. And um, it's inspiring to me. And uh, I believe that uh, that is what Jesus is pointing us to in this next section of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Um, and it's so easy to get caught in focus on temptation and evil and what does all that mean? But uh, ultimately, the prayer starts with this request. Lead us. God, lead us in a particular direction. Um, and it's a very, very vital prayer. I don't know about you, but um, I sense a lot of anxiety. I feel a lot of franticness in the world. Um, not just when I'm up here speaking either. That's, and that's normal for me to be a little nervous. But um, there's some franticness going on and some anxiety in it. I think part of it comes because we have so many different voices jockeying for our attention and so many different things um, calling to us that we could be focused on, uh, that, it's, that it's actually hard to have a focused life. Um, there's what our spouses want us to do, what our friends would have us do, what we want, um, the pursuit of success in our careers. Uh, and then we're so exhausted from all that that we, we want to binge watch Netflix because we're just so tired that we need at that point, to escape in relaxation, um, the amount of energy it takes to, to avoid difficult situations, um, a desire for more of what we want, and that's not even counting all the stuff that's just unconscious. It's in the air that we breathe. Um, there's so many like uh, unknown kind of expectations, and I was reminded of this. Christina and I went last week down to Orange County and um, as we were coming back home, Christina said, you know, I'd, I'd almost forgot what Orange County was like. And there's a particular way that like people in Orange County think, um, and I think it was because she'd gone to a church service that was much more like a rock service uh, or a rock concert. And, um, and there's just a feel to Orange County. And, and I like to not think that there's a feel in Seattle that we're just real and authentic. But then you talk to somebody from another place and they go, oh no, there's a feel. There's the Seattle chill where we're very friendly and polite to one another, but we don't actually want to get to know each other. And uh, there's a number of things and we wouldn't even be able to identify them. Um, and in the midst of all of these voices, Jesus' prayer is so important. This word, just lead us, God. Lead us. Um, asking God to lead us is a significant act. Um, it's a countercultural act, and it's an important act. And it is not an easy act in this culture by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I get reminded of this on a daily basis. I take our little dog, Gabby, for a walk. She's a pretty darn good little dog. Uh, she does um, usually what I ask. When I, when I say, let's cross, she knows that it's time to get across the street. And uh, if I say heel because something is a is over there that I don't want her to be a part of. She will generally do that. But man, a squirrel comes along. It's over. Walks over. Gabby is pulling me at full strength. Thankfully, she's only 40 pounds, so she doesn't get very far. But she will pull so hard that she will start coughing. Um, and I notice that with me, it's fairly similar. I can be cruising along in the right direction, listening quite well, headed in the right thing, and then something just takes me off into left field. It's not always a squirrel, but uh, the distractedness keeps going. Um, and it's so easy just to get led away from where we want to be. When I was living in Arizona, I was driving um, one day to work and I 
I pulled out onto the street and the car that was coming down the street was going much faster than I thought. And I ended up cutting this guy off and he had to hit the brakes and slow down. Thankfully he didn't slam into me, but he was just pissed. Starts hang, honking his horn and, and I'm scared, I'm nervous because I almost got in an accident. And then he starts tailgating, like dangerously close tailgating me. So I'm thinking this is a bad spot to be, so I better just pull off. The very next like uh, little neighborhood, I pull off onto this little side street. The guy follows me and um, continues to follow me. And I go, well, uh, I don't know what to do now, so I'm just going to keep driving straight and hope that he decides to go back to the main road. He didn't. He followed me like three or four blocks and then starts honking his horn and waving for me to get over. At this point, I'm terrified. Uh, is he going to get out of his car with a bat? Is he going to... Uh, I don't know what to do, but, I, but he, I pull over and I roll my window down like three inches because that's about all I'm going to give this guy. And he gets out of his car and he comes up to my car and he goes, all you had to do was wave. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he just wanted me to wave and acknowledge that I cut him off. But meanwhile, both of us are now like a good solid mile off of the road that we were trying to be on. For a good 15 minutes past when we needed to be there. And um, I know that when that guy got to wherever he was going, if he was late, he would probably say, ah, some jerk on the freeway cut me off, and that's why I'm late. But the reality is, he was late because he let himself get led away. Partially by me and partly by his frustration. Um, and it comes along that easily for us. Um, what we need in our lives, amidst all the voices, amongst all the distractions, is a good leader. Is someone who will lead us in a good direction. And God is offering to do that, and that's the importance of this prayer. Lead us. Um, who gets to lead you? Who gets to have a say in your life, and how will it shape your life? Um, I come from a family that doesn't know how to do marriage. Everybody in my family has had a divorce except for me at this point. Um, and Christina's family, equally true. And I wish I could say that Christina and I have been married for 16 years now. 16 years. Uh, because of our great virtue and the fact that we are a perfect match. Um, it is neither of those things. Um, I do not think of myself as having great virtue and we did one of those like premarital tests about matching and they say that you should have like 66% in common and then the other 33 is how you grow each other or something like that. Christina and I were the act, exact opposite of that. We were like 33% in common and 66% differences. Um, but the secret to so what we've been able to build is that we let ourselves be taught by some really good folks who knew how to do marriage. Um, we let ourselves be led, even though it wasn't uh, the natural thing to do. Um, so I think the same is true in life. Our default pathways oftentimes are broken. And um, there's sort of this like movement of find my voice and be true to myself. And um, I think that that's really good because I think people need to be free to be themselves. But I'm not sure that trusting oneself is always the best approach. I think you can honestly be uh, pointed in the wrong direction and try to be true and go down that path. Um, we need something greater than ourselves to follow. And so God gives us a lead. How does he lead? He leads us by his Holy Spirit. Have you ever had that nudge to just call somebody at a certain time or um, know that this is the right thing to do even though you're not quite sure why you might be able to say that um, a conscience all those things I, I attribute to the Holy Spirit he leads us by his word if we spend time in the word it will shape us and we'll begin to think um, things that wouldn't have necessarily come the way that we had thought they would and yet Jesus has this weird upside down kingdom where the poor are valued and where the humble in spirit are lifted up. And the more and more time we spend um, with the Lord and understanding his word, the more it can shape how we actually live our lives. 
meditate on it, consider it, let it get into you. And then, and then there's community. Um, the people around us will shape us. And we get to pick that. That um, we get to actually choose who it is that we will listen to. And, and I'm very, very thankful for this church family. Because I look around this room and I feel so good about the fact that you guys can help me see my blind spots. Um, I don't have it all together. But there's enough trustworthy people in this room that my life might turn out pretty good with God's help. So, um, Walt and Sheila, the other week, came up to me after my sermon, and, and they made a really good point. Uh, that, well, you're talking about going after God's will, and, and, and they talked about how um, a, a parked car doesn't really steer very well, and that it's a do something. That part of this process of being led by God and being shaped by God, uh, whether it's getting into his word, whether it's just saying, God, could you lead me through this day? Could you show up with me at this work? I don't know what to do about this situation. Whatever it is, doing something to let God know that you want to be led by him is enough to get the car moving, and then the car can get where it needs to go. God can help steer it. Um, it's diving in. And where does God lead? Well, Jesus states the obvious. Not into temptation. That's not God's business. Um, I read so many uh, scholarly dialogues about this particular topic. Uh, does God lead into temptation? Uh, what about when Abraham was tempted to bring Isaac up for a sec? Was that being tested and led into temptation? And, um, and I think in this life it's hard to sometimes tell. And I have a buddy who... Every time something bad happens in his life, he assumes it's because God's testing him. Um, and it's a really, really interesting thing because it's really hard for me at that moment to go, or just somebody else made a bad decision and you're reaping the results of it, or you might have made a bad decision, but uh, everything is a test from God, but um, God is not the tester. James 1.13, uh, Christina, if you could bring that up for me. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. The honest truth of the matter is that God doesn't have to tempt us. We're quite good at it, actually. We have natural inclinations to find ourselves in temptation quite well, and God doesn't actually need to aid us in doing that. Um, this is the very first week of Lent. And this is a season when we um, sacrifice something, some people sacrifice something, uh, to um, show like unity with Jesus for when he was in the wilderness, tempted for 40 days in fasting. And I want to read that passage for us because it's, it's, it's actually the picture of temptation and what it is that we get tempted by. So um, we're going to put it up on the screen. I know I missed a few verses during the worship service, but... Uh, Hopefully this will make up for it. So, Luke 4, 1 through 13, the temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And I'm going to pause this right there, but we'll keep going on in a minute. Um, that first temptation is the obvious one. He was tempted by his own desires. Uh, he had been in the desert 40 days. He was really, really hungry. That is a natural desire. And the fact is, our desires are good. Um, but not when they get out of control, not when they get out of the boundaries of where God intends them to go. And so Jesus was tempted to use his power to satisfy himself. Um, it is really, really tempting for me to use all of my energy and all of my strength and all of my power to build a great life for me. But if that's all I do, it will never satisfy me. It will never fulfill me. Um, when we use our power and our ability not to glorify God, not to serve others, but to build a life for ourselves alone. Um, healthy living, 
spiritually, relationally, physically, it will all go out the window. Um, let me tell you how it works out in a really small way for me. I'm trying to eat healthier, right? I, I'm kind of always trying to eat healthier, I think. Uh, I get stressed out sometimes and uh, things start to feel a little out of control. There's a lot of stuff going on that I can't really actually fix. But what I can control is what I eat. And so I go out to uh, lunch and then um, I decide to soothe myself with a very large bacon burger. I know what's actually best for me at that point. It is not the bacon burger. Um, but I want something just for me. Uh, or um, Christina will see me uh, a little bit depleted and go, man, you need to do something that will refill yourself. So what do I do? I go play video games. Because multiple hours of video games never actually refills me. A small amount of time with God in prayer would have been fantastic for that. But I want, want something for me. Um, the fact is, our desires don't lead us into places that we get fulfilled and refreshed and renewed. Um, but God does. He leads us into places that are green pastures, that are rich and full. Um, which brings us to the second temptation. Um, if you could put that up. The devil led him into a high place, and he was shown in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, <laughs> worship the Lord your God, and serve him alone. Um, another one of the things that threatens to lead us, that will not take us into fulfillment, is things that we don't have yet. Uh, the Bible sometimes uses the word coveting for it, but it's just, I want something that's not mine. I don't have enough. And we end up living in this place of scarcity and chasing something that will somehow satisfy us. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of my favorite books, and in it, a man who has tremendous resources pursues wisdom, pleasure, <coughs> stuff, his own ego, wealth, a legacy, and all these things he finds to be a chasing after of the wind. And I love that phrase because it describes what we do in our life. We, we run after something. And have you ever run after something and then got it and then been like, well, that was kind of anticlimactic. Uh, that didn't actually satisfy me as much as I thought. Um, and then we figure out the next thing. And we can actually spend a good chunk of our lives pursuing Things that will not actually fulfill us. And yet, what is the things that God says for us to desire? Righteousness, goodness, more of him. All of those things would fulfill us um, if we let him lead us into those. Now, I was thinking about those Olympic athletes. Another part of their life is sort of getting a coach, right? And, and the coach will probably tell them, you know... Bacon burgers might not be the food of kings if you want to be the absolute best curler you can be. So maybe you should eat this instead. Um, there's, a, there's a submitting of um, the goals and a, tr and a trusting of somebody else to give you a better goal. And I think that's a part of this inviting God to lead us, not into temptation. The last temptation of Jesus The devil led him to Jerusalem, the capital city, to the most important religious place. He had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Um, can you imagine what would have happened in Jesus' ministry if he had actually done this? He could have gone to the temple. All of Jerusalem's there. He could have thrown himself down. The angels would have caught that him. How many people would have instantly become followers of his? The mission would have been advanced so quickly if he had just done this. And in a sense, that was the temptation. It was one of pride. It was throw yourself down off this temple. Let the people marvel at you and what you can do. Press them. 
Temptation will always push us towards our own ego. Uh, I want to impress. I want people to think well. I want you to think well of me, if I'm completely honest. I want uh, people to appreciate me and think that I'm valuable because maybe if they do, I might feel a little bit more valuable inside. But when I get rooted in God, what I find is that God says, you already are valuable. You're mine, and I made you. You're beautifully and wonderfully made. You're already a masterpiece. He gave his life for us. What could make us more valuable than Jesus laying down his life for us? In that sense of not needing an ego, not needing to impress, not needing to be impressive, um, gives us a durability and a stability that we can't get from the world. Uh, this week, um, Lindsey Vaughn, our medal hopeful, didn't quite get a medal. And the amount of hate mail that was sent to her was ridiculous. Um, and it, it, one of the comments was, you know, your president was watching you, you let him down. And I was thinking, what if Lindsey Vaughn actually cares <laughs> about that? Um, and one of her fans was kind of railing against people for, for being so hard on her. She'd done the best she could. And Lindsey Vaughn actually responded to her message. And here's what she said. It's okay, Julie. Not everyone has to like me, but my family loves me. And I sleep well at night. And I work hard. And I try to be the best person I can be. If they don't like me, they're lost, I guess. Thanks for supporting me. That's a beautiful thing to be able to go, I don't really care. They don't have to like me. Because God made me. And I'm valuable because of that. When we let God be our leader, rather than our pride or our ego, we can be comfortable in our skin. We're not wounded when people don't like us. We're not overly excited when people do. We get stable and focused and we can live for God. And it's so freeing, my friends, to have an audience of one person to impress. To only worry about what God thinks of you. It is the most freeing thing in the world, especially when that one person that we want to impress is the most loving, graceful person on the planet. Now, um, the trick with this temptation stuff is, like I said, one, we're very good at finding it, and two, we're not always good at avoiding it. We won't always avoid it. We will at times fall. And that is why I think it is so crucial uh, that Jesus prays not just for God not to, to lead us into good places, but also when we don't make it to those places, deliver us from evil. We need a God who can do more than just lead us into good places and tell us the right direction. Because we're not so good at always finding the right direction. And so we have a God who saves us. Matthew 18, 12 through 14. Uh, here's what Jesus had to say. What do you think? If a man owned a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills to go to look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in Heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. I think um, in the midst of failing at times, I don't think of God as happy to save me. Maybe he's mad. Maybe he's disappointed. Maybe I could have done better. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes in my mind. But according to that scripture, God is thrilled to save us. He's happy to bring us back home. That's who God is. He loves. He extends grace. And he saves. And again and again and again, we find Jesus hanging out with the people who we would least expect him to hang out with, saving them. Even from the cross, he looks at the soldiers that are putting him on that cross and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's pleading for them to be saved. There's a reassurance in this that God is not just a God who wants good things from us, 
but he's a God who absolutely is willing to deliver us from evil. And there is evil in us and there's evil in this world and it was on full display this week. In light of the, the Florida shooting, um, I'm reminded of, of something that one of the parents of Columbine's school shooting uh, said to Congress. I want to read it for you. It's, it's, I think, a pretty powerful thing. And it speaks to this. Since the dawn of creation, there has been both good and evil in the hearts of men and women. We all contain the seeds of kindness or the seeds of violence. The death of my wonderful, wonderful, wonderful daughter, Rachel Joy Scott, and the deaths of their heroic teacher and the other 11 children must, who died must not be in vain. Their blood cries out for answers. Get this. The first recorded act of violence was when Cain slew his brother Abel out in the field. The villain is not the club that he used. It wasn't the National Club Association uh, the true killer was Cain, and the reason for murder was in Cain's heart. In the days that followed Columbine's tragedy, I'm amazed how quickly it is that we point to groups such as the NRA. Now, I'm not a member of the NRA. I'm not a hunter. I don't own a gun. I'm not here to represent or defend the NRA because I don't believe that they're responsible for my daughter's death. Therefore, I do not believe that they need to be defended. If I think they had anything to do with her death, I would be their opponent. I'm here today to declare that Columbine was not a tragedy. It's a spiritual event. It should be forcing us to look at where the real blame lies. And much of the blame lies here in this room. Much of the blame lies behind pointing fingers of the accusers themselves. And I wrote a poem four nights ago that expresses my feelings. Here it is. Your laws ignore our deepest needs. Your words are empty air. You've stripped away our heritage. You've outlawed simple prayer. Now gunshots fill our classrooms and precious children die. You seek for answers everywhere and ask the question why. You regulate restrictive laws through legislative creed, yet you fail to understand that it is God that we need. It's so tempting as we respond to this Florida shooting to think that it's just we need more resources for mental health issues and we need uh, better gun laws and those are both probably true we need better things in those areas but I'm reminded of Martin Luther who um, described the role of laws as an attempt to restrain evil it keeps evil contained at a level where it doesn't destroy the world quickly if we have laws but it's not the cure If we want deliverance from evil, whether it's in our world, whether it's in our country, whether it's in our family, or whether it's in our lives, it's going to start with changing hearts. And the only force on earth that I know of that can change a heart to make it good is God. We need God to find us, to save us, and to bring us back so that his kingdom and his will can be done. I read the statement by... Um, the Florida shooter's attorney, she describes him as a very broken human being, and I believe it. And he's probably more broken than most. Um, but we're all broken, aren't we? Uh, we're not going to be shooters in schools. That's so easy because it's so extreme to go, that has absolutely nothing to do with me. But I've shot a few words in my time that have hurt some folks. Uh, I've taken stuff from people uh, that wasn't mine to take, just like he took lives. We need God to deliver us. And it's not a one-time choice. It's, it's a daily struggle. If we want to see less evil in the world, it starts by letting God lead and letting God save. And there's a promise in Scripture. It's, it's 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Um, and it's a crucial word. It says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just and he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, admit you don't have it together. Admit you need God. That's where it all starts. Let God lead. Let God save. 
And the answer to what happens when that happens is something I want to close this sermon with. And it's Psalm 23. I want to read it for us. The Lord is my shepherd, leader. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I won't fear evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is what happens when we take seriously lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May those words of a rich and full and abundant life that Jesus wants to give you be the story of your life from this day forward and in this world more and more. Let's pray. God, we need you. We need you to lead us because there's a lot of folks competing uh, for where we're going to go. And honestly, the biggest of that is ourselves. We trust you more than we trust ourselves, and so we put ourselves into your hands. Guide us, direct us, point us towards good things. And Lord, when we forget what those good things are and we get pointed in the wrong direction and we go in the wrong direction, save us. Bring us back. Get us back into your fold so that we can have life and have it abundantly. We love you. Amen.